Amen. Good to see all of you. Uh, welcome to City on a Hill. Uh, we had a large crowd here on Thursday night. We uh, gather on Thursday nights at 645 and Sunday morning at 10 a.m. It's identical services for those of you that are, are new with us. And we had a big crowd on Thursday night, I think, because everybody knew they were going to party at the weddings all weekend. Knew they'd have a hard time getting up this morning. So I think uh, a lot of folks came in and uh, visited, uh, got their gathering in on Thursday night. It's good to see all of you, though. My name's, uh, like I said, Tim and... and uh, uh, here's what we do at City on a Hill. If you're new with us, we uh, make much of the name of Jesus. We are a simple church in that, and so we ordinarily preach through books of the Bible, but currently we're in a series uh, called The Eight Most Important Sermons You'll Ever Hear, uh, The Essentials uh, of Our Faith, and today's the grand finale of that. We'll be finishing that up. Next week, we'll be into the book of Jonah, and that'll press on our uh, race issues a little bit as uh, Jonah was the, probably the greatest racist to ever live uh, that came to Christ. And so, uh, good to see, like I said, good to see all of you. And um, we're going to be mainly in the book of, uh, in the 10th chapter of Romans this morning. So if you have a Bible, uh, you might uh, scurry on over there. As we finish up the sermon this morning, there'll be some other opportunities for you to fully engage worship. We'll be taking a family meal together, and we'll just get it up front that uh, communion here is open to anybody who... Uh, Believes in Jesus, has been indwelt by the Spirit of the living God because of um, a regenerative faith that's come along with that. And so we welcome you to, to come and experience that here. That's a time that you can, if you walked in here with uh, something pressing on your life or you walked in here full of joy like I am this morning because it's been an incredible weekend in, in the gospel around this place, uh, then that's a good place to express that. And we'll just praise with you. But if you have something weighing on your soul, we'll be happy to pray with you uh, during that time as well. And then uh, we want you to invite you to worship fully today as uh, God offers us the opportunity to give to his movement and church all over the world. We do that in a joy box in the back. It's our members celebrating uh, faithful giving to God's church planting and uh, birthing of his uh, kingdom all over the world. So we invite you to do that as well. So today we have been pressing through what the gospel does in us throughout these eight sermons. We talked about what, just what the gospel is. We talked about what the gospel is in us, what it does in us. And we, now we've been talking about what the gospel does through us. And so we're going to start this morning by just making this statement. Uh, we are all called into Christ likeness. And here's something that we know that Jesus was the greatest missionary to ever live. Ordinarily, when I make that statement, it is often the first time that many people have ever thought about Jesus being a missionary. And if you think about what a missionary is, that's somebody who sets aside what is good for them in their own personal bubble world. And Jesus had a pretty good one sitting on the throne of heaven, yes? He, he uh, had a good daddy next to him. He had a spirit serving him, taking care of him. He was in a perfectly loving relationship there. And because of his love for you and me, he traverses across the cosmos, changes locales from heaven to earth, and takes on one of these things that um, I've been in the process of a, of a diet purge this week, and so uh, there's all kinds of weird things happening with this tent right now, but um, Jesus put one of these on as a missionary, left the comforts of heaven, that's the definition of a missionary, leaving the comforts of what's comfortable for us for the good of others to meet his love, yes? And so if we are to be a follower of Jesus, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus in this room, that means you have the press to be an effective missionary as well. If you need to hear that in scripture, John chapter 20 and verse 21, Jesus said, if you want peace, peace be with you. Uh, as the Father has sent me, even so, read it with me, I am sending you, and that was written to the disciples, but it's also, we know by the power of the Spirit, written to us as well. So he, think about that now, Jesus says, um, the Father, we were comfortable in heaven, he sends me across the cosmos to a wicked and depraved place from a place of perfect and clean. Uh, oftentimes we're not leaving quite that a holy a place to uh, go on mission to somebody else. Why did God do that, though? Why did God send you? Well, we find out from other spots in Scripture that it was to reveal his glory primarily so that people would look upon Jesus' arrival and say, God is amazing. 
Look at God's glory, that he would look upon you having met Jesus and say, that's amazing. That's why some of you actually need to have uh, an emotional experience with the gospel. Not just this head knowledge, I believe, but this emotional experience with the gospel so that somebody would see passion in you and go, that's God's glory. I want a little taste of whatever is going on in there. Um, Many of us walk into our relationship with Jesus in a lot of difficult circumstances, broken by different things. And so the fact that people would come to us looking a little dour makes sense, but we can't stay there. We cannot stay there. We must receive Christ's healing and we must um, become emotionally engaged with the gospel so that people look upon us and see that we've been loved, we've been healed, we've been served We've been, and, and the, the good news has been brought, brought to us by the great missionary Jesus. Think about it. He came across the cosmos to be killed to show you his love. To be killed to show you his love. The least we can do is learn to go across the street, right? Kanoa, uh, one of our members here, wrote a great post this week that it was a little disheartening to him as he and Mattia were hanging out down at Arnold City Park earlier this week and... Uh, There were two ladies, it was about 150 degrees with 150% degree humidity, one of those days in St. Louis, right? And two ladies were down there, literally, they'd probably sweat 30 pounds off a piece. What they were doing, they were with a local cult handing out tracts. In the middle of all that sweltering heat and discomfort, they were being missionaries. And Kanoa wrote how brokenhearted he was that oftentimes we'll see people giving up their lives in really strong ways like that for a lie, when oftentimes we won't walk across the street when we have the absolute truth. And, and I thought it was quite poignant that he, that he wrote that. Now last week, Josh did a great job walking us through John chapter four, where Jesus is being a missionary as he walks through the hated country of Samaria, as he's dealing with his own Jewish racism, he would have been taught to hate Samaritans. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? That Jesus in his culture would have been taught to hate these people. And and we know that he was tempted in every way. So we know know that he never actually engaged that hate. But as as he gets pressed by the spirit to enter Samaria, uh, he goes with a message of salvation. And that's a great intro for us as we encounter Jonah next week, right? As Jonah is also asked to go to the most hated people on earth for him as a missionary. God has a sense of humor like that, doesn't he? He says, oh, you want to be with me. You want to be faithful. You want to actually say you want to serve me. Well, here, let me, uh, you know that person that abused you when you were a child? I'm sending you there. Or wherever you think that most hated person on earth is for you, God has a sense of humor. You need to, I'm going to grow you up. I'm going to mature you to the point where you can actually handle those environments. Well, Jesus walked into that environment, and, and here's what he taught us. He taught us that, as Josh pointed out to us, that um, Jesus taking care of our physical needs always leads to his, the word of his truth becoming a reality. He may start by taking care, compassionately taking care of some needs. He had a woman who was coming to the well with some physical thirst, but he didn't stay at just the physical Thirst, the word of truth connected to that physical need. First of all, isn't it amazing that as a woman came to drink at a well, that there was a well at all? Uh, one thing that would be really productive for your thinking about your life, as you're, we're all very introspective, is to think that, you know, if it's true that um, the punishment for sin is death, then I actually don't deserve the next breath that I take. That's a gift. The fact that this woman had been provided a physical well that provided physical water so she could continue to breathe and and have life is a gift. It was created for her. She's standing by in this passage in John 4, the creator of the well and the water. And then Jesus, the creator, connected the physical with his metaphor. He said, I am the living water. You guys are all familiar with this, I think. Maybe. If you're not familiar with the Bible, it's John chapter four. And he's, he said, I am the living water. 
This water that you seek here will take care of you in a temporary way, but I'm the one who, if you'll just drink of me, if you'll but believe in me, I'll take care of your soul, all of your needs for all of eternity, if you'll but trust me. Powerful metaphor where he connects this physical need to the eternal. And in the same swoop says, solus Christus, that only happens in me. Jesus says that only happens in me in me. And so once again, if you're new with us and you want to know what we're all about, we're about that sola. There is no life outside of Christ. There's only Christ alone. So he taught that his missionaries were to address both works and word. The physical, the emotional, the spiritual, it's a holistic thing. He doesn't just address uh, one thing. And so here's our big idea today. It's this, our life as a missionary will involve both the word of the gospel it is to be spoken. Those who say I'm on mission and never, never walk through the story and say we're all depraved, kicked out of the garden because of our rebellion, Jesus came, lived perfectly sinless, died on a cross sacrificially to repair that and has been raised again to provide all the power for his righteousness to come to us, that's the word of the gospel. That must be spoken at some point. And the works of the gospel the taking care of the oppressed. And we're going to walk through all of that today. It's always a both and, but maybe not on the same day. Jesus in John 4 walked it out with the woman at the well. It happened in the same day. You know, he waited by the water, waited by the well because he knew the woman's physical need would bring her there. And he talked about physical water, but then the main message of the day was the spiritual water. And so we know that if she was going to physically die later that day because of her thirst, then he would have ramped up the attention to the physical water. We don't have anybody dying here in America. There's some people in this room that go on mission to some places that if some physical needs are not provided on occasion, people get close to death. That's not the case here in America. We're often filling some physical needs simply for the purpose of setting the oppressed free in all these multiple ways to gain access to relationship so that we can address all the needs. That's what Jesus did here. He knew the well would cause a conversation between two groups of people that ordinarily hate each other. Everybody tracking with that? And we always say on mission around here, a full belly is insufficient if they're still headed to hell. Everybody tracking with that? So, so like if you have been called into a, a call for social justice because people are in need, that's a beautiful thing. But just understand as a Christian call, that is only part of the story. It's always works and word because full bellies and hell are not a good combination. So let's ask this, was it a good day if Jesus had done the works of pulling up some water from the well for the woman if he had, she had left his presence without knowing who he was? Well, we're going to use Romans 10 to answer that question. So those of you that have been clinging to Romans 10 as I preach John 4, we're ready to roll in there. Verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim, the gospel. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, made right with God, declared not guilty, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But here's what we know is that Mental assent to a call on the Lord is not belief. Many of you have very confusing people. Maybe you've had a period in your life that you were very confusing because just saying I believe in Jesus does not mean you've been regenerated and dwelt with the Spirit. What he just says is regeneration of the heart. There's actually been a heart of stone taken out, a heart of flesh put in, and now a confession flowing out of that heart change means that regeneration has come. Those people will be saved. Those people will have God's touch on their life. Those people are in. 
We have this horrific thing in the America that we've created all kinds of ways for people to believe that they've been saved, and so we're a nation of false conversion. We have this way you do it. You check this. We have this way you do it. You say that. We have this way to do it. And that is not salvation. This whole passage is showing that true belief in the heart will precede any kind of proclamation. And so how do we get there? He just told us. It's with the word from verse 8. What is that word from verse 8? Well, it's not just giving someone a coat if it is cold. That may be a part of the package. To be very blunt, it is the spoken word of the gospel. Romans 1 is very clear. What is the power of salvation? The gospel, the story, the idea that this thing with Jesus actually happened, and now it has become all that I am. A regeneration that becomes a story that we hear in our head and we might process in our head to being that which fills our being. Not some little mental ascent, but a possession of our soul. It wins us. We still stumble around because we don't have it all figured out yet, but it wins our soul. The story the good news that we're kicked out depraved sinners and Jesus has come and died and been raised and won for us redemption. And it is stated, not just implied. People say, well, you can see that in my life. No, we need to hear the name Jesus because that's a, that's, a, that's a definer, isn't it? You can say, well, I told somebody the gospel. I told them I believe in God. Well, I got news. I got some Hindu friends in India that would say, I believe in God, and they have about a million and a half of them. And so when I say to, them, when say, when I say to my Hindu friends in India, I say, um, yeah, so uh, I'm all about Jesus. Do, do you know anything about Jesus? And they'll go, oh, we love Jesus. And then the conversation proceeds, and in the next four minutes, I, under, I understand that they've placed him amongst the million and a half. So as soon as now I say part of the gospel is that Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, the only way, the only truth, the only life. Now we've drawn a line of demarcation with those folks that forces a decision, right? Now if the spirit is regenerating them, they now have a line that their belief will step them over. But if I just go, oh, that's cool. Jesus is in your package. I think you're probably in. I didn't give them the Jesus of the Bible. I gave them a Jesus that's palatable to them. I gave them a Jesus that we can make up in our mind and, and works for us, right? If you ask them, you'd say, well, do you believe in Jesus? Ollie believes in Jesus. She's saying amen right now. Stated, not implied. Right before this in Romans 9, Romans 9 has been all about that God chooses and God saves. And now Romans 10 is giving us our role. This good news must be proclaimed. It must be proclaimed. Anybody have a lost family in this room? I want to see your hand. You got a lost family? You got a lost family? Everybody's in your family saved if your hands are down? So my dearest family members do not know Jesus. They have no chance to be saved without the proclamation of Jesus, without the proclamation of good news. I don't want to say no chance because there's some people we know that have been saved in visions and dreams, but Romans 1 says... The power of salvation is in that proclamation with your voice, with your words. He'll bring your friends, he'll bring your family, he'll even save your hated enemies. Oh, I don't want them saved, I want them in hell. Right, let's just be honest. Well, we, we, that's another sermon, we'll get to that one soon. Verse 14, how then, here we go, let's get to the crux of the matter. How then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? How will they call on him if they've not believed? If people are not regenerated, they have no chance to call on Jesus. And therefore, they're still in their sins and they're still headed to hell. And how are they to believe in him in whom they have never heard? Heard. Not seen. Heard. There's all kinds of uh, ideas here that this thing is something that leaves a mouth and heads into an ear. And how are they to hear without someone preaching, without somebody speaking the gospel? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? 
Americans have this proclivity to love our, to love our living rooms, right? The death of mission in America is the garage door opener. Bam, up, when I get home from work, right behind me, bam, down, and I don't talk to anybody else. That's going to have a gospel proclamation problem. You can't save Netflix. You can't speak into the television and save the cardinals. They need some salvation. <laughs> As it is written, how beautiful, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. That's just weird. But, but they have not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us, so faith comes from hearing in the ear, salvation, sanctification, your growth in faith. That's why you're here this morning. You're hearing the gospel. This will ramp your faith. Faith comes from hearing through the word of Christ, the word of the gospel. This whole thing's about Jesus. This whole thing is about life, death, resurrection of Jesus. We've got that figured out, right? I don't know how much more clear that can be. Our city, um, good shape. Arnold, St. Louis, good shape. Our county, good shape. Our nation, you know, my parents grew up with the idea that this, this place was a Christian nation. Ooh, yeah. Weirdness there, right? Our, they're all wrecked with disbelief. I mean, wrecked with disbelief. You, I always tell people, you don't want to know what happened on your street last night. If it didn't happen inside your house, you're lucky. But you don't want to know what happened on your street last night. I believe that maybe, listen to this, maybe while we have about 75% of Jefferson Countyans probably who claim Christianity, that maybe 2 to 4% of them are regenerate. Maybe. Does that shock you? That maybe out of 100 people that you see that two to four, just, you know, if you need a, a apologetic for that, just walk into Walmart and walk through the aisles and see how many people you think act regenerate. Sometimes I walk in there and our members are beating a child or something and they go, wow, that's amazing. If that's true, here's the point behind that. It's not to just run our community down. It's this, if that's true, how will they believe? See, this entire community can be changed, but it cannot be changed through government moves, improvement in the schools, more education, more intellect, more sociology, better counseling. It cannot be changed from any of those things. It can only be changed one heart and soul at a time by it becoming a heart that is completely about self. Because if you look at every problem in our culture, it is that people look out for themselves primarily and first and for foremost, and including us if we're walking in the flesh. And so regeneration brings a new me. And then us together, bringing more into the fold, working with other good quality churches in our city can change our city, can change our region, can change our country, can change our world. We have a simple job in that deal, each and every Christian, and that is proclaim in word and deed. Everybody says, I don't know how to be a missionary. Proclaim in word and deed. We can help you get that figured out. That's why the church exists, by the way. The church doesn't exist as something for you to attend, for you to just improve your soul. It, it is a place that organizes us as the body of Christ to be a shining city on a hill to our community so that they would uh, desire to know Christ. A functioning missionary team, you might say. And deed and word, it's usually in that order. We're not the saviors. Everybody get those of you that want to change the world by yourself, just remember this. You're not the Savior. We are not the Holy Spirit, but we do one thing like the Holy Spirit. We proclaim, we herald the name of Jesus. 
There's not many, let me, let me put it this way. The reason it's two to 4% is that we have heralded the name of churches instead of heralding the name of Jesus. One of my favorite Christians in my life, a man who is deeply responsible for my salvation, tends to herald the name of his church vastly more than he heralds the name of Jesus. And I have to call him into repentance on that sometime. I have to guy, give the guy who missionaried me into loving Jesus a healthy rebuke with that sometimes. We herald, we announce. Good news is that God is preparing to save people all over the city. Those of us that are leading churches in this region, even right here in Arnold, are getting the feeling that there's a change coming in the game. So my question to you is, don't you want in that game? I don't know what you think is gonna fulfill you, but the, if, just think if, that, if those figures went from two to 4% to four to eight in the next year. What would change around you? First of all, you, because you're in the game. People say, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't feel fulfilled. Get in the baptism waters with some people that you have brought to Christ because you proclaim the gospel to them and they actually receive regeneration and you will feel the most fulfilled you've ever felt in your life. Most people come home from work and go, God, I hate my job. I don't feel fulfilled. Well, it's because you were not a missionary at work. God, I hate that. We're people of discontentment because we're not pressing the only thing that will fulfill us into the things that we are asked to do. Simple. So I got some challenges for you. I have five. You ready? You ready to be challenged today? Welcome to City on a Hill. Challenge number one is that in the next couple of years, you are in those baptismal waters with somebody who does not believe in Jesus today and you don't know them either. So it's going to require a couple of things, right? It's going to require that you not put your garage door opener down and just veg at your house. It's going to require that you view yourself as a missionary in every walk of your life and meet some not yet believers. Work up some relationship with them. We do all this training around here about how to do this, right? We don't cold call. We allow the spirit to determine the day that we actually do this. But then we lay the superior story of the gospel over their story so that they, hopefully they may be saved. And you pray for them extensively, time after time. God, save this person. They don't know you. But this is not your old friends. This is not your old family. This is somebody you don't know today. So you're going to have to actually press out as a missionary. You're going to have to exegete your neighborhood. You're going to have to exegete your workplace and figure out what it would look like to create a relationship where you could actually speak the gospel in to somebody's circumstances. Proclaim. And then, of course, at this church, it's not just Arnold, it's not just Northern Jefferson County, it's not just South St. Louis County that we're worried about. We have planted churches in Bangkok, uh, Thailand, uh, helped the bridge plant churches in Haiti, um, planted churches in India, uh, a big part of a couple of movements in Africa to plant churches where there is no gospel proclamation. If City on a Hill went away tomorrow, there would still be gospel proclamation in this city. There's other good churches here proclaiming the name of Jesus. There are places that if the, if the churches went away that we had planted, there would be no gospel proclamation in those places. Pastor Jerron, this morning in Bangkok, let's see, that would have already been hours ago because it's forever over there, right? Proclaimed the gospel in a place of one million people to about 35 people probably, that there's never been a church there till we planted one, ever. In the history of the world, there's never been a church there. That's different. Unreached people groups is important. But we planted those churches when we were healthy at home. It's neat that there's some folks from the bridge here today because we all did that together. We planted those churches when we were healthy at home and then we got dysfunctional honestly and those works stalled we want to know why we need to walk into health why we could because cool things like planting a church with pastor Duran in bangkok and all the work that's happened in haiti and all the work that's happened in three different nations in africa happened because we were healthy as a body but we're healthy again so another challenge challenge number two we get back in the unreached people group business here we go First step is just let's get a church planner, a potential church planner from an area that has unreached to come to Soma Immerse in the next two years so that 
uh, this Soma Merce, that all these folks were just here living amongst us, getting trained, that one of those would come from a place where there is no church. That's gonna require a couple of things. That's gonna require some fundraising because most places that are unreached are very poor. So we'll have to fund the whole thing. We'll probably have to fund an interpreter because if they come from say Thailand or India or Haiti, somebody's gonna have to be able to communicate well there. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but then we wanna restart and fund support of Heaven's Bridge, Pastor Jaron's church in Bangkok. We shut that down to become our, support, our financial support to be in, become a little introspective, uh, get our building bought here, personal health in a building, but it's time to un- engage unreached people groups again. Would that excite you? Should. But life in Jesus is more than just gospel proclamation. God has a heart for those who cannot take care of themselves. He came to set the oppressed free, is the way he put it. Spiritually, obviously, our number one need, but also physically, emotionally, every way possible. We know that because as he started his public ministry, he uh, stood up in the synagogue in his hometown and cracked open the scrolls and he read from Isaiah 61. So I want to read that to you out of the book of Luke here right now. Here's what Jesus said. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And I love that him starting or Isaiah starting that and Jesus quoting that because that same spirit that was upon Jesus that made him the ultimate missionary is upon you. You do not have a junior varsity Holy Spirit. You have the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, empowering you to be concerned about what Jesus is concerned about here. So stop saying, I'm not qualified, I don't know enough, because you kind of are insulting God himself who indwells you. You do know enough, you are powerful enough, you have that spirit residing in you. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. You need to be able to say this about yourself. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. And he's once again speaking primarily to those who are slaves of sin, but it's not limited there. And recovering sight of the blind, he goes to the physical. Yeah, spiritually blind, pretty obvious as we see his public ministry roll out that it's also Physical blindness, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Yes, yes, in sin, broken, cannot see truth, cannot, cannot function in this world with any kind of goodness except self-goodness. And yet, it is also to set the captives of, of those who cannot function in society because they cannot help themselves. And why does he do it? To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor for his glory and glory alone. Now, every little Jewish boy sitting in the synagogue that day who probably had Isaiah memorized, would have known that he was talking about the Messiah, the coming Messiah. And he literally set off a firestorm with what he said next, which was, as we continue, maybe. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture, this messianic scripture, this description of the coming Messiah has been fulfilled in your hearing. But people who say he never claimed to be God, that is ludicrous. <laughs> he just said, I am he. I'm the one. God himself. It's on. Messiah is here. By the way, if I just read that, right? There should be some kind of emotional engagement there. I'm just telling you that when, when, when things are read like when, when it's prophesied that Jesus, that the Messiah would come and here's what he would look like and then he steps in and I think he fulfilled everything in Isaiah 61 there. If you just read a little farther in, into the Gospels, right, and it should begin to stir us. There should be some emotional engagement because I got news for you. Unless you're passionate about the Gospel, you're not going on mission. Until God has stirred your emotion, not just stirred your brain. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. I see it. Yeah, yeah, my my little logical brain lines all that out. Until you are stirred. Stirred. Because he didn't have to come. And out of love, he did. You're probably not going. You'll always choose you over others. I will always choose me over others. Until I am stirred. 
And the reason you're not served, you shut your emotions off for some reason. It's time to let them go. But don't miss how the prophet said this. Restoration has come. He says to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to bring relief to those who can't help themselves. Sinners can't help themselves. But the broken can't help themselves either. And there's financial slavery. There's emotional slavery. There's physical slavery. There's all kinds of slavery that he wants to bring relief to that he sends his missionaries to handle. So challenge number three is this. It's just time for you to figure out as an individual how you're going to engage the oppressed and then act on freeing them. So that'll be works into word, but where in culture are you experiencing somebody that cannot help themselves? One of the most beautiful expressions of the gospel in our county is hand-in-hand pregnancy center. And, and let me just share a couple of things about there with you that hand-in-hand does a couple of things that if I've still got self in me, I find interesting. They absolutely put no parameters on how much they will give away to somebody. In other words, you don't have to bring us anything. You don't have to serve us anything for you to get all of this stuff. Anybody that's ever been served there know that's true. Name and address. Phone number. And people go, aren't you worried that those people are going to use you? And, uh, and my mind just runs to Jesus going, um, thank goodness he didn't wait for me to sign an agreement to clean myself up and love him and, cl- and clean my life up and get my life all in order so that I wouldn't need more grace and I wouldn't need more of him. Thank goodness he didn't si- I didn't make me sign up all that stuff before he came, first of all, and died on a cross and was raised and then came and visited me. I think that what they do down there is a beautiful expression of the gospel because it is here. You have need here. It's time for us out of our self-righteousness to stop putting parameters on our help for people. And as I say that, I'm convicted, just so you know. As I say that, I'm convicted of my own arrogance and self-righteousness. The natural way for you to do that is like Jesus did. Bring the ones that you're discipling to the party. Stop taking your kids to the park all the time and take them somewhere where there's massive need for Jesus. Sometimes that's the park. Sometimes it's Walmart, right? But sheltering our kids from the devastating effects of sin is a horrific gospel mistake. Uh, most of you know this story that a good friend named Mark Sigma, who pastors one of the best churches in St. Louis and St. Charles, and Mark took unbelievable amount of criticism from suburban white parents for taking his four-year-old son into a drug house on mission. That son is eight now and is one of the primary gospel proclaimers around. And I believe the reason is that Mark kept him safe but revealed the need for Jesus to him by showing him that. How old was she the first time she went to Haiti? Eight. Did you take some criticism from that? Yes. We have a daughter here that goes to, Emily that goes to Haiti as an an eight-year-old and people went crazy. Not as crazy as they did on Mark for the four-year-old into a drug house, but but crazy. Because safety first, safety first, safety first, safety first. Mission is not clean. Let me say that again. Mission is not clean And so we get uncomfortable. God grows us up in that uncomfort. She got a good view of what, uh, what it looks like to need Jesus, didn't she, at eight years old? Didn't you? And we're not trying to scare those kids straight. Some people think, yeah, take them in there. Show them how wicked sin can be and they'll stay away from sin. No, that's legalism. That's performance-driven life. That's Uh, behavior modification. We're trying to show that if we don't shine light into darkness, it stays dark. 
The challenge number four is we take our friends with us into difficult places, just like Jesus did. I've had an interesting weekend. We, St. Louis was a hub this weekend of a worldwide movement that needs to take place. The church's biggest thing it needs to repent of in the last 100 years is its treatment of the LGBT community. And there was a conference this weekend in St. Louis to try to get that right. Uh, Wesley Hill, all kinds of the best folks in that world were in our community. We are housed with full of people, housing people f- for the conference this weekend, and it was, an, it was an incredible blessing. And so, um, but a lot of darkness in that community. Once the light comes in, it's as light as anywhere else. But the church has got to get it right. The church has got to get it right that our job is to set the oppressed free, to come and really get all that figured out. And what does that look like? And what is required for the oppressed to be set free there? And we're going to do some teaching on that um, because that's a difficult mission. Because the church has been so hurtful there, there's a lot of reparation has to take place before we can even have a conversation. But those conversations took place in microcosms all over the city this weekend. I can't tell you how much progress was made in one weekend. It is astonishing. Correct progress. Not giving away any biblical doctrine at all. Correct, loving progress. Beautiful. You should be excited. But difficult mission makes disciples. Jesus didn't take his disciples into soft mission projects. I'm preaching at Heights next week, and I get assigned uh, Legion, right? I get assigned this man who is walking among the tombs filled with maybe as many as 6,000 demons. So those disciples who went with Jesus into that one, that was a difficult mission, right? We would all be a little nervous. Dude's cutting himself, throwing stuff, throwing big boulders at him. Uncomfort, difficult mission makes disciples. James 2 puts it this way, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed, they're oppressed and lacking in daily food, they're oppressed and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, I'll pray for you without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. We've recently seen some beautiful expressions of that. They're all all over the place around the world that we're running with because people uh, have been setting the oppressed free. Uh, Some folks from the bridge get uh, shared blessings started in Bonterre, which becomes Haven of Hope here, which now has become uh, Mercy House Ministries in Memphis, um, where... Single African-American mothers are being welcomed in with their children to be taken care of, to break some of those cycles. And here's their mission statement. Helping single moms move, and you can see sitting on a hill language here, can't you? From surviving to thriving through the love of Jesus. The oppressed are surviving. And the goal for Jesus for them is that they would thrive. How much difference would it make in our urban cultures if people were looking upon some 20 or 30 people per city block who were thriving? In the middle of hopelessness, they see hope. If I showed you the faces of some of those African-American females, single moms, and their kids who are receiving the gospel at Mercy House and then walking back into their neighborhoods in some thrive with a job, with some hope, And people looked on that, they go, whoa, whoa, something's going on here. And things incrementally begin to change. Why? Because we had some social program? Mm -mm. Uh -uh. Because this social program has Jesus, has the gospel. That mission statement says, through the love of Jesus. Not just to make sure these single moms and kids are safe, which they are, and fed, which they are, but it is for the love of Jesus. I have to tell you that it's pretty rare that you see people, and this is what's going on there. You see, you got all these white folks who live in the city of Memphis who are setting aside their lives for these folks they do not know. Different race, ordinarily their habits would aggravate them, but Jesus has 
created this love in them that their life's over. They're giving up their lives. And so it's rare that you see people engage folks long term without any end game of re- return. The end game of return is always, will you come to my church? Will you join my church? Will you give to our church? Will you give the money back that we, we kind of loaned you? So that's the beauty of hand in hand. They're just going, there's no loan. Grace upon grace upon grace. That's what Jesus does for you, right? Is that not what he does for you? I don't know about you, but I'm a wrecked up sinner and, and thank goodness today there's grace upon grace upon grace. We must aid with no demand. Many times our sin nature refuses to help those who cannot help themselves because there's no end game for us. That's not, that's not mission, by the way. It's called self-indulgent self, selfishness is what that's called. Look at Jesus' teach on this. Luke 14, he said this to the man who had invited him. When you give a dinner or banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. That's all we do usually in social life, right? Lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. The white suburban culture. You give me a gift and I can't stand it. At some point, I've got to give you that gift back. I can't tell you how many times I've given somebody a Starbucks card and within three weeks, there's a Starbucks card coming back. Why? We can't stand grace. Just take the gift, enjoy the coffee. Enjoy the coffee. You don't have to pay me back. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, the oppressed. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. That's why we have to get out of our comfort zone and find the oppressed. When you give somebody in Haiti something, they can't pay you back, right? What are they gonna pay you with? Love, eventually that comes back, right? For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. You start to get little hints of that because people that actually meet Jesus begin to love you back. You wanna send me some love back? I don't need a Starbucks card. I can afford my own Starbucks, but you wanna send me some love back? I'll take that. That would be fantastic because that's what we're called to do. Challenge number five is simply this. If the cross has stirred your soul, and that's a massive if. As you take communion today, that's the first question I want you to consider. Emotionally. God gave you your emotions for many reasons. The number one was so you would have your emotions stirred about the cross of Christ and that empty tomb. Number one reason you were given emotions. And so so my first question is simply that. As you come and take communion, you don't, you, don't, you don't need to not come and take it if you're not stirred, but why? If you're not stirred, why? And, and if, if that's all you do is you walk up and you go, listen, I believe in Jesus and I'm happy, I'm loving the cross and the resurrection, but I'm having an emotional issue here. I was having it the last three months. Prayed the other day that God re-engaged my emotions. Went and saw my 93-year-old mother who's struggling and I was a wreck. God answered my prayer. I said, can we go back to this like detached thing? I spent like 36 hours isolated from everybody because I actually had the audacity to pray that. Well, now the weddings are wrecking me. This relationship with all the people staying at my house, I'm all wrecked. I'm crying over everybody. It's fantastic. Kind of. If the cross has stirred you, Let's go start there. Are you stirred? The challenge is, though, is if that's so, do the work of an evangelist. Works in word. Works in word of Jesus. Works in word of Jesus. With works and word, it's a both and. Find the oppressed, serve them, set them free, love them, give them Jesus. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you. Um, First of all, Uh, I think all of us probably need to reflect right now and think of some people in our life who did the work of a missionary, did the work of an evangelist for us. We know the gospel for some reason, and it's probably because somebody in our lives set their life aside, stopped being selfish, and loved us really well by saying, listen, like, you're oppressed, man. You deeply need Jesus, and he's the solution. He actually did 
come and live and die and was raised again and sits at the right hand of God the Father and he's coming back. And that's all you need to know.